Is this the best Mercedes EV yet? A full driving review of the Mercedes EQE SUV with Thomas and Autogefühl in 4K full screen, full length. Let's go here. You can see the closed front grille here with an optional micro star pattern. Very beautiful design indeed. This is the AMG line. That means sporty accentuations in the side lower part. We'll soon also comparing the electric art line. This color is also very special. It's called Alpine Gray. It's a special AMG color actually for the AMG line here. And we also have a beautiful shooting location here on the Portuguese coastal line. 4 meters 86 or 191 inches is the length of the EQE SUV. So the smaller brother to the EQS SUV. This is more than in the competition, for example, with the BMW iX. Wheels from 19 to 22 inch. These here are the 21 inch wheels. At the side, you can open this one here for the wiper fluid, for example, but you cannot open the hood. There's an optional HEPA filter underneath when you order that one. And technology news here for the EQE SUV is you can, if you have the all-wheel drive version, it means one like the motor in the rear, one in the front, decouple the front electric motor so that you have efficiency gains when you do not need it. But you can also get an entry version with rear-wheel drive only. Testing here the EQE 500, that is an all-wheel drive model. And these technology updates that come with this vehicle here will also go to the other Mercedes EV models like the normal EQE, the EQS and so on, EQS SUV. But this one here starts it. And there's the second news, not only decoupling of the front wheels, but also standard heat pump now, so you will have less range losses in winter time. This one here visually comes with this sidestep here, this really cool design element and also aerodynamic performance. And then here we more have a coupe line, I would say, and with a very strong shoulder area. Another technology highlight leads us to the rear axle because the rear axle steering, that's an option, can turn the rear wheels in the opposite direction than the front wheels up to 10 degrees. That massively reduces the turning circle by up to 2 meters, easier U-turns and so on. And design-wise here in the rear you can see this light strip going across and on the sides you have this 4 element spiral whereas the EQS SUV would have this 5 element spiral. Very interesting. In the lower part, AMG line. Are these even pretending to be fake exhaust? <laughs> what do you think? And battery size, by the way, it's always around 90 kilowatt hours. You might see in the price list, there are some versions with 89 and others with 91. They don't differ that much. It's just from a different supplier, but the charging times are also pretty much similar. It's always around 30 minutes from 10 to 80% state of charge. If you have the biggest power boost, which is at 170 kilowatt peak. Turning indicators replace the daytime running light in the front and the rear turning indicators at first sight it doesn't look that spectacular but when you look closer it uses these vertical structures and that looks quite cool then. Also features a very cool welcoming light signature. Look at that when I open the vehicle how the light builds up. There we go. Pretty spectacular. By the way, not to be recommended, but yeah, sometimes I just can't help myself and also do fun things with vehicles, which are not useful. Yeah, <laughs> not releasing the parking brake and then slightly applying the throttle. Again, don't do it, but it looks weird, all right? <laughs> and here we can very well see with the two Alpine Gray AMG color cars, here the side steps. We have it on our main vehicle and here it's the same color, but without that side step. It really looks different, but which one would you prefer? Aerodynamics wise, by the way, the sidestep is better. It actually serves aerodynamics because the air is being channeled in a better way underneath the vehicle to the rear. And more colors for you. Here, for example, a subtle lift blue, a rather darker blue tone, but I think it suits the vehicle very well with the same 21 inch wheels. Or what about here, this diamond white bright vehicle? You have more contrast than here with the wheel arches in that case. 19 inch wheels so you can see how the car looks like with smaller wheels yeah the bigger wheels do look better right but then with the air suspension you can also even out this comfort difference and here we can also see a difference amg line with the sportier accentuations in the lower part and the electric art line is a little bit more subtle has this more closed look not that sporty and also more chrome in the lower part more set on elegance and here you can also see that this star pattern it's just an option, doesn't have anything to do with AMG or not AMG line. But hey, it does kind of look cool with the tiny stars, doesn't it? And this is how it looks like in silver. 
all what about in all black. Moving towards the interior, this is the key fob, really premium alike, I like that. Then here the door handles, flush, integrated, and then you can open them like this. They are an option in the EQ SUV, and I think yeah, it's a little bit over-engineered. Then door closing sound, it's really solid. Inside of the doors, this material is called Neotex, it's a new material, neoprene alike, it's a mix of microfiber and leatherette, feels cool, looks cool, really nice. Then here at the inside of the doors, you also see this nice integration of the ambient lighting also here around just a high gloss piano lacquer here and the lacking haptic feedback of the seat controls, what I would criticize. This is the AMG line interior, soon going to compare the electric art interior. Here also with the optional hyper screen, which looks fancy, but is it worth it? Soon more deals to that. Here the steering wheel, AMG line with two spokes left and right. The electric art steering wheel would look different. And these seats here are the comfort seats. They are sports seats and comfort seats. Also in the AMG line, you can go here for the comfort seats. The sports seats not available in the US and they are also more narrow. Here the comfort seats are definitely better. Here with the animal skin wrap and you see here it already looks old and it feels kind of rough and hard. So not good material quality. And here we can see soon that the electric art Artico cover is way better indeed. Seating position, I'm really happy with that actually. Good comfort here on these comfort seats and even more than in the electric R with the full article interior. This is also better than in the sedans because here you sit a little bit more upright and with 189 or 6 foot 2 you also have enough headroom. This is also the version here with the panoramic roof by the way and it leaves a lot of light in. Really cool. You can also open it. That's also cool. Is it very well usable? Hmm, more or less because, yeah, already like 60 kilometers now or something, there are, there are a lot of wind noises, so it's not the best panoramic roof to drive at higher speeds. You have to know that if that is then relevant for you or not. Rear doors, here also with the high-grade leather retina and the Neotex on the top part. It's really well done as for the build quality. Then you can see no middle tunnel, purpose-built EV platform. That's good actually. And since everything is more upright, and although you have the shorter wheelbase than the EQE sedan, you have a lot of legroom here. It's no problem at all. Headroom also works for tall L's, so five tall L's is fine. Just that the middle seat is a little bit hard at the back part. The outer seats are definitely way more comfortable. And in the lower part, we also have a separate climate unit here, but it's this one button design again, and below that, two USB-C chargers. And here we can fold down the cup holders. This is like a smartphone holder, and then like this, you can release the cup holders. Interior cockpit overview. This is here the optional hyperscreen, like one glass unit, 17.7 .7 in the middle, 12.3 inch on the sides each. This is the passenger screen, which now is featuring this personalization with your favorite image, or maybe, or maybe also of your dog, your cat, or your wife, or your husband. So, which one would you actually put there at the uh, at the passenger screen? This is optional, however, and I'm not sure if you would go for that because it is really expensive, can be up to like 8,000 euros extra. And the base setup here, we can also soon show that to you, is to me actually a little bit nicer even. Here the digital instruments, nice visualization. You can also pick the style, sport your way or understated, or then the map full screen. And wow, this is cool here with the satellite view, definitely. My favorite is off-road that, yeah, just looks coolest, doesn't it? And the head-up display is really large and you can also have some GPS visualizations in there. Some love it, some think it's too much. The ambient lighting, I found it pretty cool actually. You have this color transitions if you like. You can also change the whole color and either in a multi-color way or maybe also just a single color, so you can really pick that. And what's also quite cool is that when you use the AC unit, you can see warmer or colder as an additional visualization. What are you actually doing? Apple CarPlay or Android Auto integration is really massive indeed and also works quite quickly. Wireless or wired, both is possible. Burmester sound system or Burmester is really Wow, good sound and they concentrate on having the original source basically transported to the sound system as accurately as possible. That's their goal. Then you can also see the satellite view 
in full glory. Wow, look at this. That looks really, really cool, right? Yeah. Here, for example, you can see that here from the sites in Lisbon. That looks, wow, really like, like in a game, right? <laughs> And new with this software version introduced by the GLC is here that you have the see-through bonnet with that camera. This is the live camera feed and this then here in the middle part is being built up while driving from a past camera image. But here you can see it helps that you can see if there's a sharp stone underneath the bonnet and maybe damaging the tires or something. The passenger screen is only active when there's someone on the seat with a seat sensor and then you basically have the mirroring of everything else, but you can also have video streaming while driving. That's the difference, and the driver then cannot see it. Beautiful matte wood decor. Hmm, really cool. And then inductive charging pad, two USB-C chargers, but also here the adaptive cup holders. But when you have like heavier glass bottles or something, small ones, they don't hold them that tight. Then let's make it clean close again. Here there's a unit for the driving mode selection, for example, and start-stop of the vehicle. Then you have the split armors with more space underneath. Not to forget this huge space here underneath the middle console with more charging possibilities. Let's also take a look at the electric art interior we have here, starting at the inside of the doors, with, a, you know, with these nice new materials that has neoprene finish. And listen to that. Also, you know, when you touch it, how it sounds, really cool indeed. This is also the base steering wheel. That one looks better in the AMG trim, I think, because again, in AMG you have the two spoke design. Here, there's one spoke design. But this interior is also without any animal materials and the steering wheel feels good. And also here with the seats, this is very astonishing. This here actually looks better and feels softer. And look at this different cockpit. This does not feature the optional hyper screen. Then you have this vertical layout, like we know from a C-Class or the S-Class and so on. And you have here space for decor element and you can pick different stylings. So a very interesting 3D structure underneath here. So I found actually more beautiful without the hyper screen. And also here the digital instruments are not integrated, they're more upright and they give you actually better visibility because when it's leaned backwards then the sun can also uh, get to that a little bit better here this way better view so this solution here saves money and to me it is also better as for the user interface what do you think we flip the logo here to open the trunk or the boot. 520 liters up to 1675. And then here, there says no rails at the side, but it's actually good in the build quality. And then underneath here, we also have a lot of space for charging cables. The length here is 94 centimeters or 37 inches, and the width is also between the wheel arches. Yeah, easily a meter or 40 inches, you can see here. And the total height is also important. So it's actually quite substantial, 72 centimeters or 28 inches. So this is how you can use the trunk. You can also fold the seats right here, but you have to grab over. There's no remote lock or something, and then you can load through the front seats. Welcome to Thomas's driving lounge. We start with the sport mode, acceleration, slightly uphill, but does it have really enough power? Let's go. Stop, that's 90 kilometers an hour. Ooh, that went really quick. I mean, the official figure was five seconds, like what, 4.9. Whoo, more punch from the rear, from the strong electric motor. Wow, I was really pushed into the seat. That was a lot of fun, really cool. And we first check out the agile driving characteristic here because the EQE is shorter than the EQS SUV. And so, also gives us more driving fun. It feels definitely more agile. This year even has a shorter wheelbase than the EQE sedan. Very interesting concept indeed. However, due to the low center of gravity in these electric vehicles, the batteries are placed in the middle bottom part, the difference between driving a sedan and an SUV body type is slimmer here with electric vehicles than it is with combustion engine models. We have no shaking up effect or something. In the sports mode here, this optional air suspension is set on a stiffer note, so there is no rolling or something really cool. The rear axle steering at higher speed gives us rather more stability because then it turns into the same direction than the front wheels. At lower speed, soon going to show that as well, it helps with turning circle and also easing the car in and out in the city and parking lots and so on. And yeah, this is a lot of fun indeed. 
pretty cool. It is not the most sporty EV overall there is. There are sportier EVs out there, but considering what you expect from the outside, how the car looks, doesn't look like a sports SUV or something. It's also not supposed to be one, but it is really decently quick and it is still fun to drive. The steering input is really natural and likable and you see, you don't have to steer that much. Mercedes has changed that with recent new models. Before that, you had to always steer quite a lot with Mercedes, more set out on comfortable driving straight and so on. Now you have to steer less without, you know, it being too sensitive or something. I think they found a very good um, solution here that it's sporty, fun to drive. You don't have to steer too much, but still remain with this very natural steering character. So in this case, I think very well done. And also here in the city, since we have that shorter wheelbase and the other models feels actually pretty much at home, you can ease that here around also more narrow roads and so on, no problem at all. Most important thing in city driving is when you have the optional rear axle steering in the highest build, up to 10 degrees, the rear axle goes in the opposite direction in the front wheels and situations like these, it feels like you would be turning on standstill, you know, like, like, wow, that's really amazing. I mean, it's not a small vehicle at all, but this option actually reduces the turning circle by two meters. So this has essentially a turning circle of a small vehicle. Did you hear this chime, by the way? It's very interesting, this new law for European vehicles, which coming new to the market, new homologation, that actually you need to have a warning chime as soon as you exceed the speed limit, even if it's just one kilometer an hour. And the thing is really, it can be very annoying because, I mean, let's be serious, when it's 40 kilometers an hour here and I mean, we hit like 41, who cares? That has nothing to do with speeding or being dangerous or something. We all agree that especially in the city, especially like where children are present, everyone has to slow down and drive the according speed limit and watch out. No doubt about that, you know. I'm not, I mean, I'm absolutely pro, you know, keeping the skip to speed limits, but keeping it realistic and not annoying for the driver. I think that's that's the key thing. Mercedes has thought of that. That's very interesting. So when you exceed it once by just, you know, maybe a small minor or policia, <laughs> then you can either click the small symbol here on the screen. There's like a um, traffic sign symbol with a with a speaker or the alternative would, would, would be to hold the mute button for a second and then actually this chime is being muted by law once again this is reactivated every time you restart the vehicle yeah and with some vehicles we had for example with the neo vehicles we had really funny experiences because it was like very loud annoying maybe it's done like by voice assistant that it really literally tells you you have exceeded the speed limit here this chime but i think it's pretty cool that they directly thought of that to have actually two very easily accessible shortcuts to turn that chime off yeah this is the thing where the development of the car industry is heading to everything is more and more automated and things are getting also more and more annoying some things improvement in safety are good and also help us. Some new technology feature are beneficial for customer, also for safety and so on. But if that's really so beneficial, I don't know. What do you think? And motorway 80 to 120. Top, that's it. Was even a little bit more, so that was slightly down about the power is definitely there. And here, Portuguese motorway, 120 kilometers an hour is maximum this part here. And super side in here, although it's quite windy outside, close to the sea, it's quite normal, but the noise insulation from the windows and so on is really very good. We have the optional air suspension in this very vehicle, and it really gives us good floating comfort. With the 21 inch wheels, of course, when you have some fierce bumps in the road, then you do feel them. If you would go for smaller wheels, you could even that out better. But I like that the air suspension is not too hard, actually. And you can also adjust a little bit by the driving mode here in the S Sports mode. It's a little bit stiffer here in the Comfort mode. Then you have more floating effect. And that really gives you good comfort, definitely, while driving. So you can enjoy it, at least from the comfort aspect. 
also on the motorway, also long term, even better than with the shown article seats because of the softer surface if that, that's available on your market. As for the assistance systems, consider here on the steering wheel, adaptive cruise control, ruling back and forth and also left and right here with the active steering. Here on the Portuguese motorway, they are not that high in speed compared to Germany, but here you can see we can very well test because there are quite a lot of times that like bend, especially here in this Lisbon area. Here, right side, I didn't steer at all, so you see very smooth reaction here from this active steering assist. That is indeed also well done. If you, by the way, go on the brakes, then you always have recuperation, but hardly any in the normal recuperation mode. And then you can adjust it here at the shifting pedal, so to speak. For example, you can go left for strong recuperation, then you have much deceleration when you go off the throttle, or on the right side, no recuperation. Or then, the last setting is the auto. And that is doing, for example, when I'm closer here to the vehicle in front of me, and have the auto, and then I go off the throttle, then I have recuperation, for example. But then when the sensor is not picking up anything here when I have more freeway. There's no recuperation, it's just rolling. And I think that's a good setting. There's always the discussion between predictability or making it purpose built, you know what I mean? And you can argue both ways, both have something. The only thing is, no matter which setting you pick, after a reset of the vehicle, after the next drive, everything is anyway reset on the normal recuperation. The reason is not because the manufacturer wants to tease you or taunt you, it's a mandatory reason by law because they have to make these driving cycles always in the same recuperation mode. Yeah, but that's not ideal for the customer. Mm, I think regulation-wise this should change. Ideal temperature conditions today here for running battery electric vehicles and then we could score some consumption figures of 20 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. That's some three miles per kilowatt hour, meaning a real road range of 450 kilometers or 280 miles. Again, that would be a little bit less than in worse conditions temperature-wise, but the new standard heat pump will hopefully also even that out a little bit more. Well, if you want to compare the competitors like the BMW iX or the bigger brother, the EQS SUV.